This is lectures four and five, where we'll be talking about risk management and we'll be talking about cost. So before we start, a quick reminder of where we are. So we are now here. Lecture one was where we spoke about project planning. Lectures two, we spoke about work breakdown structures and critical path. And now we're going to be talking about risk and cost. You've already completed task one. You have completed task two and uploaded that. You've completed task zero and you've completed the resilience questionnaire. You should now be working on the interview and the digital storytelling tasks. So already you have racked up 15 plus 15 plus 5 percent of the module. So we're already past the halfway part, uh, point. Next Friday, you will have your first class test. Now, this will be a one-hour open book test. And it will cover all of this material. So everything covered up until the end of this lecture. So all of this will be included in the first class test. The second class test will include all the content. So it's everything covered until today, plus the final lecture. So class test one, as I said, it'll happen next week. It'll be one hour before the workshop. So that means at 1 p.m. It'll be open book and it'll be online on Vital. Okay, I'll be available just before the test, just to take any questions and to um, to get you organized. So I'll be available from around 12.45. But the actual test will be at 1 p.m. Okay, and I will send an email with further details about the test. So it will be a computer-based test, so you will need um, access to a computer. It's open book, so you'll have access to all your notes. But you'll only have one hour, so it'll be... Um, you won't have much time to, to read the notes and learn things during the test. You really need to be prepared. So it's a combination of multiple choice and numerical questions and a few matching questions. It isn't too difficult if you're prepared. If you're unprepared, then the simplest of questions can be difficult. So in terms of your uh, virtual project um, progress, you have already looked at that as part of task one and you've developed a uh, work breakdown structure you've done your gantt chart your critical path analysis and you've done your work change order as part of task two so now we are going to look at risk and that is what task three is all about. So when we talk about risk and risk management, what are we talking about? So recently, for your specification report, for your final year project, you will have carried out a risk assessment. Now that risk is a different kind of risk. That's risk to yourself or to other people in the lab. 
that's personal injury risk. This is a different kind of risk to what we're looking at here. What we're looking at here is risk to your project, not risk as a result of the project. So we define risk as a set of uncertain events that should they occur, that's if they were to occur, they will have an effect on the achievement of the project's objectives. So it's risk to the project and to the objective. So you remember you, you defined your SMART objectives. Anything which makes achieving those objectives less likely is a risk to that project. So we're not talking about injury. We're talking about anything which might make the objectives unachievable. So there's a reference here that you can look up. And there's a link on Vital that you might find helpful if you want to read up about uh, risk. So using the um, ISO definition of risk, we have a family of standards relating to risk and importantly, risk management. So the condensed form or the condensed definition is risk is the effect of uncertainty on project, project objectives. So it's that condensed into four words. The effect of uncertainty on project objectives. Now that uncertainty we often consider to be negative. But the effect can be positive. And that's what we call a positive risk. So the risk comes from uncertainty. Uncertainty could be financial uncertainty, legal liabilities, credit risk, accidents, natural causes, disasters, deliberate attacks, terrorist attacks. But I think on everyone's mind now is the effects of the pandemic. Okay, so a pandemic is something that... Um, was uncertain, unexpected. It affected the um, achievement of um, thousands and thousands of projects around the world. So that's a huge risk. So we're going to talk today about how we manage risk. You can't eliminate risk, but you can manage it. So when we talk about risk management, we're talking about a few things. So a lot of words here and they're all separated just to make it clear. So risk management is identification, assessment and prioritization. Prioritization means a ranking of risks. So the first step is you identify your risks and you rank them. Then that just means you do stuff. So you identify your risks you do some stuff in order to minimize, monitor, and control the probability and or impact of these events. Why? Because we want to maximize the re realization of opportunities. And by opportunities, you can cross that out if you like and say the objectives of the project. What you want is you want to achieve the objectives and you want to eliminate the effects of these unfortunate events. You can't eliminate the unfortunate event, but you can eliminate or you reduce the impact of that. So there are two, several things we need to look at here. The identification of risk, so that's one. We need to look at doing stuff. We need to look at how to minimize the probability and impact. Probability is how likely something is to happen. And the impact is what effect that'll have. Okay, so all of this comes under risk management and we'll cover that in the next half an hour. So, first step, remember we said identification. So this is identification. What are the risks? So identifying risk is identifying or predicting 
those risks or those uncertain events. So identifying risk. A good project manager, that's what we're trying to do, must identify, quantify and manage all possible risks. Now, identify means to know what they are. Quantify means to ascribe a number to it. You assign a, a number, 2.3, that's a number. You quantify it. How much is it going to affect us? By how much? So quantifying means ascribing a number to something. So the best way to ensure all the risks are identified is to consider the project from a point of view of all stakeholders. So you have a project and you have lots of different stakeholders. Each of these stakeholders will have a different viewpoint. And if we look at everything which could happen, which would diminish the impact of that project for each of those stakeholders, we're more likely to be able to identify all the risks. Okay, so we're still talking about step number one, identifying the risks. So when we say stakeholders, what do we mean? Stakeholders is everyone involved, basically. So a stakeholder means someone involved in the project, but it doesn't have to be an individual. It could be an organization, it could be a company, it could be a government, it could be a charity. So we say organizations or individuals that are actively involved. But they don't have to be actively involved. It could be their interests are affected. Okay, so just think about yourself. Think about your final year project. Okay, who are the stakeholders in your final year project? Obviously yourself, your supervisor. Who else? Who else has an interest that's affected as a result of the project execution or project completion? Is the head of department involved? Are your parents involved? What about your friend? What about your boyfriend or your girlfriend? Are these people stakeholders? Are they affected by the completion of your project? Are you, is this project related to a company? Is the company going to be making money out of the result of your project? Will you be getting a job at the company as a result of the, uh, uh, completing a successful project? Will you be starting a spin-off company after completing university? Will you take your projects and try to monetize it? So always think of um, stakeholders um, beyond those who are directly involved. So a, a, a project sponsor, contractors and subcontractors, suppliers, they might have no knowledge about the details of the project. They might not know what the project objectives are but a supplier is involved he, that supplier is a stakeholder in your project because if your project fails then that supplier isn't going to be paid so the subcontractor is reliant on the contractor and the contractor is reliant on the sponsor and all of you are have interests that are affected as a result of the project execution or project completion. So these, if you like, are directly uh, related. But what about the users of the end product? What about the customers? What about other companies that might be um, threatened by your company? What about uh, other um, uh, others affected, such as your neighbors? What about the uh, authorities? What about local councils? So. Um, as you go layer by layer, you find that people further away from your immediate project might also um, have interests which make them uh, stakeholders. So you might remember this example. It's from a few years back in 2017. Samsung released its flagship Galaxy Note 7. And very soon afterwards, um, reports started coming 
in the news of the battery exploding or the battery catching fire. And these battery faults were a huge um, PR disaster for the company. So look at the, uh, look at the uh, company profits from 2014 up to 2016, and they completely collapsed at the end of 2016, completely collapsed to near zero as a result of that battery fiasco. So think about, think, so re remember, what, why are we talking about this? We are talking about risk, and we're talking in particular about risk identification. And I said it's important in identifying risk to always think about the stakeholders. So in terms of a project, and the company's project, was to release phones and to make money, that happening was certainly not good. So anything that causes something like that to happen is a risk. So that's your risk because it led to that. So the question is, could we have identified a risk like that? And who is affected by this happening? So think about other stakeholders, other stakeholders, other than Samsung, other than the poor customer. Who else is a stakeholder? So if this was a face-to-face -face lecture, we would have, I would have opened this up to you and you would have um, come forward with some suggestions. But if you just think about stakeholders for the exploding battery fiasco, who is involved? Obviously, there's the thousands or millions of customers or potential customers. There are people who wanted to buy the phone who ended up not buying the phone. There are people who bought the phone and had to ask for a refund. Eventually, Samsung recalled all these phones, so all these phones were, were sent back and everybody got a refund. Okay, but who else? If, if you think about something as big as this, um, it, 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 there was a point when if you wanted to get onto a plane, you'd be asked, are you carrying a, a Galaxy Note 7? So it became such a, a liability that uh, airlines wouldn't allow you onto an aircraft carrying a Galaxy Note 7. So imagine, imagine how much that affected the reputation of the company. How can the company um, recover from something like that? So we're not going to consider Samsung as a case study. I simply brought it up as an example. I want to um, move on and talk about uh, creating a risk register. But before that, I will um, uh, play a couple of videos for you. Of this topic will enable us to understand the risk management processes better. The purpose of a risk register is to record the details of all risks that have been identified along with their analysis and plans for how those risks will be treated. It is the responsibility of the project manager to ensure that the risk register is updated whenever necessary. The task of updating the risk register is usually delegated to the project control function. The list of risks that are identified and recorded in the risk register drives the following risk management processes which are perform qualitative risk analysis, perform quantitative risk analysis, plan risk response and monitor and control risk. In the perform qualitative analysis process, details are added to the existing list of risks in the risk register including the priority of risks, the urgency of the risks, the categorization of risks and any trends that were noticed while performing this process. In the perform quantitative risk analysis process the risk register is updated with the probabilities associated with each identified risk and the probability of meeting the cost and time projections. Additionally, risk priorities are updated and trends that have been observed are also noted. In the planned risk response process, a specific response plan is created to manage each risk. These risk response plans are updated in the risk register as an output of this process. While managing risks, we need to remember not all risks are negative. 
positive risks or opportunities. Accordingly, a project manager should devise strategies for managing negative risks or threats and positive risks or opportunities in the monitor and control risks process. Plans are reassessed and re-evaluated. The risk register is updated with information on new risks as an output of this process. This information should be regularly updated in the risk register, whether it is changes to the risk estimates or actual numbers such as costs related to weather damage. Identifying risks is the process of understanding what potential events might hurt or enhance a particular project. It is important to identify potential risks early, but you must also continue to identify risks based on the changing project environment. Also, remember that you cannot manage risks if you do not first identify them. Many potential risks can be identified by understanding common sources of risks and reviewing a project's planning documents, activity cost and duration estimates, the scope baseline, stakeholder register, enterprise environmental factors, and organizational process assets. There are several tools and techniques for identifying risks. These common information gathering techniques include brainstorming, the Delphi technique, interviewing, and SWOT analysis. Brainstorming is a technique by which a group attempts to generate ideas or find a solution for a specific problem by amassing ideas spontaneously without judgment. This approach can help the group to create a comprehensive list of risks to address later in the qualitative and quantitative risk analysis processes. An experienced facilitator should run the brainstorming session and introduce new categories of potential risks to keep the ideas flowing. After the ideas are collected, the facilitator can group and categorize the ideas to make them more manageable. However, group effects such as fear of social disapproval, the effects of authority hierarchy, and domination of the session by one or two very vocal people often inhibit idea generation for many participants. Delphi technique to helps prevent some of the negative group effects found in brainstorming. The basic concept of the Delphi technique is to derive a consensus among a panel of experts who make predictions about future developments. It is a systematic, interactive forecasting procedure based on independent and anonymous input regarding future events. The Delphi technique uses repeated rounds of questioning and written responses, including feedback to earlier ground response, to take advantage of group input, while avoiding the biasing effects possible in oral panel deliberations. To use the Delphi technique, you must select a panel of experts for the particular or in question. Next, interviewing. Interviewing is the fact-finding technique for collecting information in face-to-face, -face, phone, email, or instant messaging discussions. Interviewing people with similar project experience is an important tool for identifying potential risks. Another technique is a SWOT analysis of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, which is often used in strategic planning. SWOT analysis can also be used during a risk identification by having project teams focus on the board perspectives of potential risks for particular projects. Applying SWOT to specific potential projects can help identify the broad risks and opportunities that apply in a specific project scenarios. Now, we will talk about the risk register contents, and this is how the risk register table looks like. There are several contents inside the risk register table, and we will explain it one by one in more a while. We start from the left hand side of the risk register table. The first one is rank. This is the place to determine that which is the rank for each risk through matrix. Next is risk. For the risk column, it is a short or simple title of the risk. Description column, it is a brief description about what is the risk is about, the causes and impact, category. This is where to categorize the risk, either it will be market, financial, people, technology or structural risk. Root cause. This column is about the cause that would be causing the risk. Triggers. Triggers is something which indicates that a risk is about to occur or has already occurred. The next one is potential response. Potential response is the action to be taken if the risk occurs. Risk. Owner is to identify that who is the owner of the risk, who is to responsible of tracking the risk. Also, risk. Owner need to manage the risk response if the risk occurs. The next is probability. 
Probability is the probability of the risk if occur, possibility happen or not. By using scales and either low, medium or high, to rate the risk. Next is impact. Impact is the impact of the risk. Same as probability, it using scales to rate the risk and it can be either low, medium or high impact for the risk too. The last one is status. Status is to check that how was the risk ongoing currently. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that little break from my voice. If nothing else, the music was entertaining. But um, seriously, you, sh you should have seen from these two videos, for example, here, they went into some detail about the risk register and how many columns there would be in that. Whereas here, it was um, much simpler and they were using a traffic light system of red, amber, green. Um, to prioritize uh, risks and they made an important distinction between risks and issues okay and for any project you're doing whether it's your final year project or your virtual project I think it's really important that you're able to distinguish between things that have happened like the earthquake and things that you want to uh, either avoid happening or avoid um, if it were to happen that your project would be um, completely jeopardized by. So now we're going to look at a little bit, um, we're going to take some, some examples, okay? Some uh, historic examples, some silly examples, and then some numeric examples. So we're not going to go into a great amount of detail, but I want you to understand how to identify risk because we're going to use that to create a risk register. So, Remember we said the best way to ensure all risks are identified is to consider the project from the point of view of all stakeholders. So we've, we've already said this, but we've said this as an important um, step in identifying risks. And in the first video, we spoke about brainstorming. And we said there are different ways of brainstorming. And for task three, you will need to do some brainstorming. And it's the project manager 
who will do the brainstorming. So in that video, it mentioned the facilitator, but in our case, it will be the project manager. So you'll need to be able, you, you, the project manager will need to consider how the project might affect them and their interests, do some what if analysis to look at positive and negative risk. So when we talk about positive risks, here we're talking about opportunities. Whereas negative risks, that's where we talk about threats. So remember, the opportunities are your O and the threats are your T in the SWOT analysis. Okay, now there's two things um, that often come, about, come up when we talk about risk analysis, and that's mitigation and contingency. So mitigate, when you want to mitigate, it's not the same as trying to avoid the risk or avoid the uncertain event happening. Mitigation is against... It is planning against the actual occurrence of something. So what can we do to prevent that negative thing or that risk from either occurring or from impacting uh, the project? The second thing we need to look at is contingency, i.e. what should we do if the risk actually happened? So a plan of action in case that actually happened. So if it happened, what do we do? And when we talk about negative risk, almost the same applies to positive risk. So negative risk could be a fire. So if you want to mitigate against a negative risk, so you want to try to avoid that fire happening, or if a fire were to happen, how are you going to minimize the damage to your project. Your plan of action should be what to do in the event of a fire. But positive risk is how are you going to benefit? So if something were to happen that could benefit your project, how are you going to capitalize on that? How are you going to make use of that? In this project, we'll be looking at negative risk. We won't be looking at positive risk. So the idea of positive risks, not always um, immediately obvious because in English, when we talk about risk, it has a negative connotation. So the word risk isn't neutral, it is negative. But we have to remember that there is such a thing as positive risk. So it's what we would normally call good luck or good fortune. So think about what could happen which could be fortunate. What could happen which could make our project more successful? What could happen that could make the objectives more likely um, to be achieved? Or what could happen that could allow us to exceed our objectives? So, for example, let's say we were doing a large construction project in Liverpool. Let's say it was the Liverpool Arena project. Remember, there was such a thing as the credit crunch many years ago. I can't believe it's already been 11 years. But when the credit crunch came, this was around the time when the Liverpool Arena was being uh, built. So that created financial restrictions on lots of other capital projects. So that the negative risk would be that that project, our project, if we're working on this, might be cancelled. So we, need to, we, we would need to watch out for that. But there is also a positive risk. If other projects are cancelled, but ours isn't, it means that there would be greater availability of labour. So it could be that labour becomes cheaper for us. So just as there is a negative risk, there's also a positive risk. There's often opportunities. Just as there are threats, there are opportunities. So 
it doesn't have to be a large project like that. It could be a domestic project. You're installing a drainage system in the basement of your workshop or um, in, 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 your, in your back garden you have a DIY project. You're building a shed or something. A bit fanciful, but you could strike oil. If you strike oil, what does that mean? Well, the negative risk, it means that the workshop has to be evacuated. It will probably need to be demolished and whatever's happening in there needs to be relocated. So that's, that's a threat, okay? But the opportunity is you could become rich, okay? It, it, it's a silly example, but it makes the point that risk can be both negative and positive, and you need to be able to look at both. And in, in, in some ways, we've already done that when we looked at our SWOT analysis. We looked at opportunities and we looked at threats. So the opportunities was a positive risk and the threats was the negative risk. So let's look at an example, okay? This is the silliest example I could think of, and it's to plan my next birthday party. So what we're trying to do, let's just remind ourselves, where are we? We're looking at risk management. And we said the first thing we want to do is identify the stakeholders. Because that will help us to identify our risk. So it's risk identification. So who are the stakeholders in my birth birthday party? Obviously, there's me and there's my friends and family. So there's the guests. Who else is a stakeholder? Well, you've got all the, you've got my neighbours, they'll be affected. You've got the suppliers, the caterers. You've got my family, you've got perhaps the family of the guests. All of these people are stakeholders and will be affected in some way. So if we just try to narrow it down to some very simple um, risk identification tasks, let's look at different categories. If we take category A as the guests, category B as Mother Nature, and category C as the food, okay? We, we, we can probably go on and on and on, but let's just look at that simple example. So look at my columns. Risk category, risk description, and risk ID. Risk ID is just a number, okay? But we're going to need these numbers if we're going to um, do any analysis. So for the guests, what kind of risks might there be? So in my brainstorming session with my birthday party planning team, I could say, look, it could be that the guests don't find the party particularly entertaining. They might find it boring. It could be that it's quite a lively party and there's a fight that breaks out. So these are two risks. Probably many other things can happen, but for the purpose of this example, these are two risks and I've given them each numbers. So in subsequent slides, I will be adding columns to this and we will be populating this table with further, um, further information. But for now, all I'm doing is identifying the risk. So my task here is risk identification. So what about nature? What could nature do? If my party is outdoors, then it could be that there's a storm that completely ruins my party. It could be something more powerful than a storm. It could be an earthquake or a flood. This is much less likely than that, but it's still possible. Now, in terms of the food, it could be that there's insufficient food. It could be that the food spoils before it's eaten. So these, this is step one in creating a risk register. So now what I want to do is to quantify and evaluate my risk. Quantify means assigning a number to it. 
evaluating is doing something with that number. So, each risk is identified by the project manager, or each project, each, as each risk is identified, the project manager should estimate the probability of occurrence, how likely it is that something's going to happen, and the magnitude of the impact or the consequence of that occurrence. So we've got two numbers, P, the probability, and M, the magnitude. So remember where the example was talking about um, traffic lights and green, amber, and red? Well, here we'll be using one, two, and three, or low, medium, high. You could use a five-point system, but very often we use three-point systems. So low probability, medium, and high probability. Now, from these two numbers, we calculate or we evaluate something called the severity of the risk. So these two together, the probability and the impact or the consequence give you the severity. And that, the severity, tells us how much we should worry about that risk. So which is more important, the probability or the impact? Well, both. Both of them contribute to the severity. So what's the, what's the probability of a meteor or an asteroid hitting Earth and cancelling my birthday party? Well, the probability is extremely low, but the impact is extremely high. So as a result, multiplying these two, you would have a measure of the severity. So let's go back to the birthday party and look at a few examples. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to multiply P times M. It's possible to add P and M. So these are two equally valid um, approaches to take your probability and your magnitude and either add them or multiplying. Okay, how do you multiply low times medium or medium times high? Well, you need to use numerical scales, one, two, three. Okay, so we're going to be using multiplication. So this is another example. It's not the birthday party example, but here we have our risks, A, B, C. So each of these could be an event. So for example, um, when we say risk A, that could be the risk of um, a storm, for example. It looks like it's not very likely because the probability is low, but the magnitude of the um, the consequence of that storm is medium. And when you multiply low times medium, or one times two, you get three. So you get two. If you add them, you, you get three. So the severity um, uh, measures whether you add or multiply, they're pretty close. Okay, but if you notice, the differences stand out here and here at the two extremes. So we, we, we tend to prefer multiplication because it doesn't make much difference when you have sort of low or medium times medium, but it's the high times high and the low times low where it makes a difference. So we will be using this measure here. But be aware that often in the literature you will find severity as the sum of the two. And when you did your risk assessment for your final year project, for lab work, for practical work, you will also have used the multiplication. So back to my birthday party.
So we've already looked at this bit. Now what's happening? We're looking at each of these activities. So for example, the guests find the party boring. How likely is that? Well, if it was my real party, it would probably be a three. But in this example, we're using a two. So it's a medium probability that it's a boring party. But what's the impact? So if people find it to be a boring party, will that completely ruin the party? Will it jeopardize the party? What will the impact be? Well, let's say it's also a medium. So two times two gives you four. So the severity of that risk is four. If you take another example of an earthquake ruining the party, how likely is that to happen? Well, it different, depends on where you live, but living here in England, it is extremely unlikely that an earthquake is going to ruin my birthday party. So it's unlikely there will be an earthquake. It's unlikely there will be an earthquake um, during my birthday. And it's even less likely that the earthquake will be severe enough to actually ruin the party. So let's say that's a non-zero but low probability, one. What effect would an earthquake have if it did happen? What effect would it have on my birthday party? Well, it would, it would completely ruin the party. It, would, um, it, it, it could cause um, uh, considerable damage. There could be danger, risk to life. People might need to go to hospital. It, it, it depends on the severity of the earthquake. But in any case, it can have a huge impact. So one multiplied by three gives you three. So if you look at it, even though it's an earthquake, it's less severe than people finding the party boring. Because there you had 2 times 2 is 4, and here 1 times 3 is 3. So it's still less of an issue. And that makes sense. I mean, usually when people plan birthday parties, they don't worry about earthquakes. So remember we said we need to identify risk, then we need to quantify risk, then we need to evaluate risk. And part of risk evaluation is prioritization. And prioritization is what we were just talking about, ranking. So looking at risks with the greatest impact, or lo looking at um, risks with the greatest severity, and uh, dealing with those first, or assigning greater resources to deal with the more severe risk. So when you have an impact and a probability, usually the severity, high severity, will mean high impact and high probability. So when we rank, we always rank in order of severity. So we always rank in terms of m times p. Now, the clever bit is then, what do we do with that ranking? There's often a financial implication to that, i.e. there is a cost. And we need to take that into account. So all this business of evaluating risk, it's so that we can balance the risks between the high probability but lower loss versus the low probability, or sorry, versus the higher loss, lower probability. And we do that every day. So every, each of us does this on a daily basis in so many ways, without us realizing. But as you scale this up, and as you have more and more stakeholders, you can't do this without realizing. You have to do it in a systematic, a quantifiable way. And that's where this idea for risk register and risk management comes in. So here's an example for you. 
So I call it a question, it's an example. And let's talk about a risk register for ownership of a smartphone. Which risk is most significant? So when we talk about significance, we're all, always talking about severity. That's the only thing that matters when we're dealing with risk or when we're evaluating, prioritizing risk. So what's the probability or the chances that your battery is going to run out during the day? Well, it's very high. It's almost certain that your battery is going to reach low levels by the end of the day. Okay, that's if, you, if you're actually using your phone. So the probability that the battery runs low is very high. But what's the impact? What's the impact of that? So here we have P, and here we have M. What's the impact of your battery running low? Well, and unless your job is... Um, it's unless it's critical that you have a functioning phone for your job or for your safety or for your family's safety, it doesn't have that much of an impact. It's not going to have a huge impact. So we'd call it low. What about if you were to drop and crack the screen? How likely is that? Well, it's not very likely. But if you did drop the screen... Um, What's the, um, what's the uh, impact of that? Well, it's not low because you need to get the screen fixed. It might be covered by insurance, it might not. But let's say it has a medium uh, impact. What if the screen protector or the case breaks? What's the chances of that happening? Well, I get pretty low and if it does break, you're going to have to replace it. So no big deal. I would actually say that's probably an L. So cases aren't that expensive. What about if your phone was actually stolen? Very unlikely. I've had a phone for many, many years. It's never been stolen. So the chance is very small. But if my phone were stolen, that would have a huge impact on me. A financial impact and uh, concerns over, over protection of my data, my SIM card, my uh, backing up all my numbers, etc. So it would be a huge hassle if my phone was stolen. So the question is, which is the most significant? So without thinking about it too much, you need to multiply P times M. So P times M, Remember, we're using a three-point system. So this would be a three, this would be a two, this would be a one, this would be a one, this would be a one, this would be a two, this would be, if I'm using a low, it'll be a one, and this will be a three. So you have three, four, one, three. So the question is, which is the most significant, the most significant is that. So therefore, dropping the phone, cracking the screen, that's the most significant. So that's the one you should worry about most. That's what you should prioritize, okay? It's not the one with the highest probability, and it's not the one with the highest um, impact. It just happens, it happens to have medium probability and medium impact, but the product is the highest. Whereas, just notice, if we were to add, if I were to add P and M, it wouldn't have been so clear. If I had added P and M, I would have got 4, 4, 1, 4. So that's less helpful. Okay, so we said number one, identifying risk. Number two, quantifying and evaluating risk. Number three, prioritizing risk. Number four, dealing with it. So that's managing the risk. That's all the mitigation, 
and contingency, remember? An important thing is to appreciate that we can't generally transfer or remove the risk. Okay, so there are some financial or some contractual um, arrangements where you can transfer or offload or remove the risk to a third party. But we, are, we aren't looking at things in such a sophisticated way. We're looking at risks to a project. We need to be able to identify them, evaluate them, prioritize them, mitigate and uh, assign a contingency. So plan actions for contingency and mitigation and allocate a budget for dealing with each risk. So how much money should we assign to each risk? Will depend on the severity of that risk. So let's look at that in a little bit more detail. Back to our example. So this is my birthday party, remember? We got this far. So remember I said guests might find the party boring, medium probability, medium impact, therefore severity four. So two things I need to look at. Mitigation and contingency. Mitigation is really how to avoid that happening. Okay, so mitigation is how to avoid the negative consequence. Whereas contingency is what to do if that happens. How do we deal with the negative consequence? So let's say we're talking about finding the party boring. What I can do is invite a couple of my more entertaining friends, my crazy friends, and provide lots of drink in the hope that that will create an atmosphere where this doesn't happen. Okay, so this is my mitigation strategy. But a risk register wouldn't be complete without also putting in a contingency. A contingency is what to do if that fails and that happens. What do I do to then deal with that. So mitigation really is something that you plan to do so that this uh, doesn't happen. A contingency is something that you do after this has happened. So the guests have found it boring. Your crazy friends aren't making a difference. People are yawning, looking at their watch, they're on, uh, looking at their watch, flicking through um, their phones, and there's not much of an atmosphere. What do I do? Well, I could bring out the karaoke, hope that that can make a difference. So this is what I do in order to combat the effects that have already happened. Okay? So what we're now creating is something called a risk register. And this is something that you'll be doing very, very soon. And we can go through this line by line. So what would happen if there was a, a drunken brawl, a drunken fight? Well, if you, if you don't want that to happen, so mitigation means you don't want that to happen. What can you do to avoid that happening? Well, don't invite crazy friends because it's these crazy friends who are likely, in this scenario, to make that happen. But what happens if there is a fight? What are we going to do? Contingency, call the police. So you don't call the police before the fight happens. That's called mitigation. Mitigation is what you do before, 
Contingency is what you do after. Okay. And the example goes on and on. So we said there could be an earthquake. Well, mitigation. So what can you do? Um, what can you do to avoid the earthquake causing enough damage to ruin your party and to, to hurt people? Well, you can go over, for example, a disaster response plan at the beginning of the party. And if it did happen, you would implement that disaster response plan. Maybe more realistically, what would happen if there's not enough food? To avoid that happening, your mitigation might be to have some backup food, have something um, uh, kept aside just in case. What if that isn't enough, or people don't like that? Or what if there's, um, your, your backup food isn't suitable? What are you going to do? Your contingency, in case this happened and this didn't work, would be, for example, to order in pizza. Okay, So you do this. You do this for all the risks you've identified. So you've gone through all your stakeholders. You've identified the risks. You've given them numbers. More about that later. We found the severity by multiplying the probability and the impact. And then we've put two things together, mitigation and contingency. That's your risk register complete. What we now need to do, remember we said we need to be able to uh, budget accordingly. Let me take you back a few slides. We said once we've done our mitigation and contingency, we need to allocate a budget. The budget is for dealing with the risks. So ordering pizza comes at a cost. And ordering the booze comes at a cost. And the karaoke comes at a cost. So your um, mitigation and your contingency, both of them, will cost something. And we need to be able to allocate that cost depending on the severity. So it's the severity which will decide the allocation. So it's not P, it's not M, it's both of them. It's the severity. So how do we do it? So for example, in this, in this uh, table here, in this example, we have a contingency budget. So we have £104,000 to deal with with contingency. We take that £104 and we divide it by 26. 26 being the sum of this column here. So 104k divided by 26 equals 4k. So that's 4k per point. So for every point, for every severity point, we allocate £4,000. So for a severity of 2, we allocate 2 times 4k. For a severity of 6, we allocate 6 times 4k. So the amount of money, the total amount of money we know, but we assign this money to each of these categories depending on the severity. Could we have got away with planning this project without any mitigation? Without any contingency planning? We could. We could save £104,000 off this project. But it means that if any of these risks were to happen, then the project would fail. So it's absolutely essential for there to be a contingency budget. It could be that we don't end up spending all of that money. 
but we need to have that as part of the budget. And this is just an example from, from, uh, from the press, from the media. So you often find with high profile um, uh, cases, scenarios, situations, talk of uh, the risk register. So here it says, the government says the register looks at likely and unlikely risks. So what do we mean by likely and unlikely risks? That means low and high P values. Okay. And here they, there was talk about the impact assessments. So when you, when you read about this kind of thing in the media and it's, um, it, it's fairly common, you'll probably notice it more now that you've covered it in this module. So the last thing we want to look at is modeling risk. So we've looked at identification, we've looked at um, evaluation, we've looked at ranking, prioritization, we've looked at mitigation and contingency, we've looked at the budgeting, now we're looking at modeling risk. So the risk register will give us an overview of the risks. Managing the risks means we need to understand the implications of each risk occurring. This requires use of modeling to predict possible outcomes. So we're going to use a three-step process. First thing, we're going to decide whether we're interested in the cost or the time. What is it that we're trying to achieve? Are we trying to lower the cost or are we trying to lower the time? In practice, we want to lower both. But as a metric, as a basis for our risk modeling, we want to look at usually one of these two. So we need to look at three things, the minimum, the most likely, and the maximum. So you will have already looked at this before when looking at the optimistic time, pessimistic time, and the most likely. And the same here for the cost or time, we're going to be looking at either the minimum, maximum, or the most likely. And then we'll do some kind of numerical modeling. We're not going to do much in this module, but it's important that you understand how and why these things, these things happen. This is an interesting phrase here, to model and predict the range of likely project outcomes. Now, that's interesting because when we say the, the range of likely project outcomes, because a project outcome isn't binary, it's not one or zero, it's not pass, fail. Just think of your final year project. How many outcomes are there? There's so many possible things that could happen. Think about your uh, dinosaur park. There's an infinite number of possibilities. So this range of likely project outcomes requires some kind of modeling. And that's what we're going to be looking at very briefly next. So let's look at a simple example. You want to replace your living, door, living room door. Okay, really simple example. Your door's broken, you need to replace it. What's involved? Well, you need to buy a door. You need to buy the fittings. You want to paint the door. And you need somebody to come and do it for you. 
Okay, so there's five things involved. The labor, the actual door itself, the fittings, and the paint. Now, we would probably do hundreds of these things every year without giving it much thought. We would organize barbecues, we would buy furniture, we could travel, buy gifts, all sorts of things that involve this kind of uh, breakdown. But if we were to think about the costs, there's always some kind of a spread between the minimum cost and the maximum cost. If you wanted to organize a barbecue, there would be a minimum cost and a maximum cost. If you wanted to go on holiday, if you wanted to have dinner, how much would dinner cost? It could cost five pounds, cost a hundred pounds, or it could cost anything in between. So, for example, if we were to look at the cost of the actual door, in the catalogue, for example, the cheapest door is available for £50. The most expensive is for £120. But what's the most likely cost? Is it the average of 50 and 120 Not necessarily. It could be much closer to 120 or much closer to 50 So you've got these three numbers and we need to somehow use these numbers to determine what the actual cost of my project is going to be. Because if I, if I decide that I'm going to buy the cheapest door with the cheapest hinges, with the cheapest handles, using the cheapest paint, with the cheapest labourer, I can do the whole project for £192. If I go for the most expensive of everything, I could achieve the same project for £376. So how much should I budget for? What's the probability that I'm going to end up spending this much money? And this is important. We're looking at a, a silly example here, but if you're if you're organizing a large-scale project with multiple stakeholders and things which are un, uh, unknown, these things are fairly easy to plan ahead. But if these were categories where risk is involved, then if you were to budget for 192, you might end up pay paying 376. So that's um, not helpful at all. So there are ways of doing this, okay? The very simple or simplistic basic approach is simply using these uh, figures, simply using the most likely minimum or maximum costs. It gives you an idea of the range of possible costs, but it doesn't help much because I'm unable to plan. I don't know whether I'll be using the maximum the minimum or the most likely. You might think, well, just plan for the most likely. But there's a big difference between £310 and £192. And if, if you've got lots of doors and lots of uh, activities happening, then you can end up spending much more money than you need to. Or if the money is limited, you might end up um, planning a project for much greater scale, uh, much uh, smaller scale than it could have been. You, i.e. you would underachieve. So a more sophisticated, more advanced approach is where you do some kind of numerical modelling. So you have all these minimum and maximum numbers and you run your simulation, you run your modelling, it's called Monte Carlo simulation, you run it thousands and thousands of times, and that gives you a probability distribution. It won't tell you exactly how much something's going to cost, but it'll give you an idea of probabilities. And that allows you, very importantly, 
to make informed risk management decisions. So for example, your Monte Carlo simulator might carry out thousands of simulations. The first simulation might say, your labor costs 110 pounds, your door might cost 90 pounds, so it's neither the cheapest nor the most expensive. The hinges might be uh, cheap, but the handles might be expensive, and your paint might be somewhere in between. So we're not taking everything cheapest or everything the most expensive. It's a combination, it's a pattern. It could be cheap labor with a medium uh, priced door with cheap hinges, expensive handles, and the most expensive paint. So this kind of random pattern is what Monte Carlo simulation is about. So this combination might cost me 262 pounds. A different combination will cost something else. A different combination will cost something else. What we can then do is plot these total costs. Okay, so this is a histogram, i.e. a frequency graph. And by frequency, we're talking about the number of occurrences. And here you'd have your cost. So what's this, te what's this graph telling us here? It's telling us that it's very unlikely that this project will cost 200 pounds. And it's very unlikely that it's going to cost more than 340 pounds. It's most likely to, cause, to cost around 280 pounds, because that's, this is the outcome that came out most often. Now, if you turn this, so this is a frequency distribution graph, but if you turn this into cumulative frequency, it'll look something like this. So this is cumulative frequency, where you add up all the frequencies together. So this was the graph that we were looking at, but if you were to add all these light green curves, you would end up with this, sorry, light green bars, you'd end up with the, with the dark green bars. So this is cumulative, and the cumulative will always end at 100% and start at 0%. Now this is a really helpful uh, graph. This is called the cumulative probability distribution and it's really helpful. I'll show you how. For example, a question might ask, and this is the kind of question that you'd expect in your test, question might ask, look, I want to be able to achieve this project for 260 pounds. What's the probability the project will cost this much or less? So how likely is the project to cost 260 pounds or less? Now, if we were to look at this, it's impossible to tell because 260 isn't that, it's not that, and it's not that. So it's not helpful. Even looking here, 260 is there. What am I going to do with that information? That, that's not particularly helpful either. But now I have this cumulative uh, distribution, I can now look at this and say, OK, if I only have 260 pounds, or if I'm aiming to spend 260 pounds, so that's my 260. So it's around 40% or maybe 35%. OK, so just looking at that, I can determine how likely it is. So what that means is that this area here to the left, 
of 260 is around 35% of this total area. 